Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, this is the last talk of the day for day three of the Land Body Ecologies Festival. So welcome and thanks for hanging in there <laughs> today. So my name is Sam Rawit Guksa. Uh, I also go by Sam. And I am head of communications at Minority Rights Group and a privileged member of the Land Body Ecologies team uh, with the, some of whom are represented on the panel today. Today's talk is about um, challenging or questioning methods in research for climate and health. And today's focus is on audio. And I don't want to say anything else because we have a really interesting way to kick off today's session. But before I hand over to Ben to lead us through um, an opening exercise, I do want to let everyone know that this event is uh, being recorded. It will feature in an upcoming episode of the Land Body Ecologies podcast. So if you um, do not want to be recorded or don't want your voice recorded in that, um, do let us know maybe after the talk or take a, a step out of the auditorium if needed. We hope you don't though. So without further ado, I hand over to you, Ben. Great, thank you. Hi, everybody. <coughs> My name is Ben. Uh, I'm an artist and I'm uh, the technical director at Invisible Flock, who are an art studio uh, who anchor Land Body Ecologies uh, here in London. And I thought because we're going to be talking about sound together, it'd be quite nice to start by doing a bit of listening. We're obviously in the wonderfully acoustically rich environment of the Welcome Collections Auditorium. So, um, I thought instead of listening to nature, which is what I would do if we were doing this in a park, we could instead uh, just listen to each other and then the sounds of our own bodies. So we'll just take a couple of minutes to uh, loosen us all up and uh, yeah, get listening. So uh, I thought we could begin by just trying the classic, just sitting in silence and listening to the sound of the room and each other breathing in it. So close your eyes if you're that way inclined or keep them open. And let's just sit and just enjoy the silence of the space for a minute. And then what I'd like you to do is to lift either your right or left hand and just block one of your ears so you can only hear out of one ear. And notice what that changes for you in how you hear my voice, how you perceive the size of the room, how you perceive where those voices outside are coming from or the hum of that projector. And then what we're going to do is I'd like you to Click your fingers and move them slowly across the front of your face so that they pass across the field of sound from your blocked ear to your unblocked ear. Okay, all together. And keep doing it and unblock your ear and keep clicking. And listen to that sound as it travels across the space of your stereo field the oldest and simplest spatial audio trick in the book that has allowed us to survive for as long as we have because we can hear things and where they're coming from. And now what I'd like you to do is to take your hands. How am I going to do this whilst also... I'm going to shout. Take your hands <laughs> and cup them behind your ears like this. And now imagine that you've become a parabolic dish and just pan your head around the space trying to pick up frequencies and you'll find that you're going to suddenly zoom in on a sound and you'll hear it. And when you do, just move your hands away from your ears and then back just to see what that simple act of filtering out some frequencies does and how radically it can change how you can hear a space. and how that act of focusing a sound can suddenly bring it closer to you or spread it and diffuse it around you. And then finally, the last thing we're gonna do is I'd like you to block both your ears as tight as you can and just listen to the sound of yourself breathing. Take big, noisy breaths and just hear the air flowing through your body.
Okay, thank you. So, in a way, what we've just done is kind of explored some really basic ideas around sound design and how we can use them to bring things that are far away close or position things relative to our bodies in space, but also hear things that are non-perceptible and that are happening inside of us. Did anyone notice or experience anything particularly interesting they'd like to share with the group? No pressure, but I'd like to keep it informal today. It's fine if you didn't. Think about it. We can come back to it later. Cool. All right. Well, that's it. So thank you all for coming today. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you for that warm-up, Ben. That was excellent. Felt, um, it's a hard thing to come back to the mic after that. That's for me, personally. <laughs> um, so to kick off today's conversation, I just want to say a couple of words about a specific podcast that we're going to talk through today. And that is the Land Body Ecologies podcast. Um, it's produced... Uh, it, the project has been led by Invisible Flock, so Ben and Vic here. But each episode of this podcast explores stories of solastalgia from one of the um, hubs presented in the Land Body Ecologies team. So we have episodes on Kenya, on Uganda, on India. So um, I'm, I'm doing this also so you can uh, have a bit of an introduction of our amazing panel. So uh, Victoria Pratt is creative director of Invisible Flock. Uh, Samson Loari, who's project officer at Ogek People's Development Program, is anchoring the Mao Hub in uh, Kenya. Sylvia Kagunda, who is the CEO of Action for Batwa Empower Gr Empowerment Group in southwestern Uganda, representing the Batwa people. And Babita George, who is director at Quicksand in India and has been anchoring uh, the research there. So the Land Body Ecologies podcast, honest answers to the question I'm about to ask. How many people in here have listened to an episode of the podcast? Non-LVE affiliated people? Great. These are all new <laughs> downloads waiting to happen, Sam. This is good for us. This is great. OK. This works really well into what I'm going to segue now. So similar to how Ben anchored us in an exercise on sound, we wanted to introduce you to some of the sounds that have emerged through this process of making a podcast and how we as a group really believe that this creative method is a form of research. And we'll talk about that today. So take a moment. You're going to hear a sound come on. And this is what's played at the start of every episode. Nope, not that one. Can we play the audio, please? Not that one. Why are they flipping? Nope, wrong one. <laughs> First one. You're getting a bit of an insight into what we'll talk about, but the one on this slide. That's fine. Okay. Well, I encourage you to listen to the Land Body Ecologies podcast. Visit uh, landbodyecologies.com and you'll see a page dedicated to it. But the purpose of that um, audio clip, playing it for you today, was really to get a sense of the different layered and differences in sound that can take you to places, but also take you to certain sentiments and emotions. So, skipping that one, I want to take us back to the process of making the Land Body Ecologies podcast um, and think through how the idea even came up. So I have a question pretty much for you, Ben and, and Vic, because I know at Invisible Flock, audio is very central to your work. So in coming together, why was uh, a podcast an idea that came up to your mind? And tell us about the journey of how that came about. Thanks, Sam. Um, yeah, audio has always been really essential to our work as artists, and I think within Land Body Ecologies, why it's been such an obvious and natural <laughs> um, research tool for us is because it allowed us to 
listen to the human and the non-human simultaneously. Um, so I guess when we were, it's quite interesting looking at this slide. This is sort of three years ago, I think, um, when Babita, we were sat brainstorming um, what even the project would be about. Um, and yeah, showing our Yorkshire studio where Ben and I are based and India and Finland with our Arctic par partner who's not represented here. Um, but yeah, just thinking about how do we look really deeply at a place? How do we try and understand it from yeah, a non-human perspective as much as a human perspective? And what tools and technologies do we have that can allow us to do that and allow us to then communicate that outwards? Yeah, I think that so much about land body ecologies and hopefully if you've seen a bunch of the festival uh, is about stories and about how we collect stories, tell stories, and how we position voices within those stories. And I think audio has a really unique capability, I think, of being both very light of foot in the act of creating it and of capturing it, um, of being potentially less intrusive and less domineering than uh, a camera, um, but also being incredibly powerful at a very deep cross-cultural level in its reception. Um, I know that Babita, for example, has done a lot of work and thinking in the research that they were doing around the role of the camera when you go into a, an environment to work with communities or to talk to communities. Um, and and the difference that working with audio brings versus placing a lens um, is, I think, really, really important. Um, do you want to talk about that? So maybe, I mean, I think just broadly the role of stories, um, as many of you know by now through land body ecologies, we've been exploring an extremely complex relationship between environmental degradation and mental health of communities. This isn't easy to answer if one were to just do research interviews. Um, it's extremely complex and layered and naughty and painful and um, all of those things at the same time. So one of the experiments we did, again around storytelling, was to use Polaroid cameras that we gave out to members in the community. You'll see some of them up in the exhibition and the forum. Um, and it was just an open invitation asking them to tell us stories of their land, of their home. Um, and what we got through that, again, like the podcast, was incredibly rich. Sylvia, you want to speak about using? <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, just like you have seen, podcast is not a method that many people are familiar with. I also thought about it when these people came there, Ben and Babitha was like, we are doing a podcast. And I was like, well, how are we going to <laughs> listen to this? And now Ben was capturing the sounds and I was like, how is, how is he going to get the information from these sounds? <laughs> But you saw the first example, what he told us, all these things we first went through. Indeed, you can communicate through those sounds. I think everyone who had a different, like a meaning from the sounds we captured, touching the, uh, doing all those signs. And that is how we get the information or how we can even get information from sounds. Then they also used the, Polaroid cameras, they told us they choosing different people and then you say, take a picture or a photo of your own, anything you feel like. When you're happy or when you go in moments of silence or what you think makes you happy or sad, and people went. And I was all questioning myself, how is this one going to give us the information we would need? in this research of climate and health. And when people came and they were interpreting these photos, they really had a deep meaning. Where someone tells you, the reason as to why I took this photo, it is, it gives me peace because it reminds me of, like maybe it makes me happy when I'm with, I'm with my family. It also makes me happy, connects me to my culture or this is what makes me sad. 
and they give you all those reasons and are like, if people have information, they have visions on how they want the environment to look like, but they are not given a chance. Like given a chance, people can make a difference because that is when you hear someone interpreting a, pic, a photo and tells you, this is how I would love this way to be. And he takes a photo of the rivers and tells you the rivers is where we got clean water, or it's also part of my life. life. And now says, now why? It's because I'm no longer allowed to go there to fetch this water or to have time on this river. So that is the power of using podcast in research that I've liked. Thank you. I think one of the things that, because none of you have listened to it, that it's worth pointing out <laughs> in our podcast is that there's no... Uh, there's no narrator, I think. You know, the podcast world is, is, I mean, it's a meme, right? It's full of white men with big microphones on YouTube, but that's not the podcast we're making. Our podcast is fundamentally discrete individual audio pieces that use the land on which our communities live as its entry point, and that tells the stories through the sound of the land and the stories that they want themselves to tell. So a lot of the process of land body ecologies has been uh, providing field recording equipment for each of the hubs, both in Kenya, Uganda, and beyond, and uh, providing sort of training to get the teams locally to start using the equipment and to start recording and to start becoming integral parts of it. And so mine and Victoria's voice, for example, is, is never heard on any of the podcasts. There's never anybody going, welcome to LBE, this week we're going to. You know, it's the opposite of this. It's, it's entirely driven by the audio of the environment. I mean, I think a really good example of, of the power of this is, is uh, not to promote our competitors, but at British Library have got a show on at the moment, uh, which is about um, sounds of nature. And Cheryl Tip, who's a fantastic uh, trip, trip, yeah, Tip, who's a fantastic curator there, has this story about the recording of, I think, a chaffinch and uh, a last pair of them who are living on an island and how uh, every mating season they'd call for each other and they'd find each other and then eventually one of the pairs died and there was just one left. And so there's a recording of the last chaffinch on this island calling for its partner, which is obviously never going to call back. And so I think when you know the context of that story and you hear that lone bird calling, that has this incredibly, incredibly powerful effect on you. Um, and I think that, that's, that's the, the contextual power of audio. Um, yeah. I guess it's also really important to mention uh, that each episode of the Land Body Ecologies podcast isn't just one episode in reality. So I know that there is um, an A side, a B side, different language versions, and I just want to give you a chance to maybe talk about that and why you decided to go that, that route. Yeah, it was about different um, access points and different representations, I guess. So we have the, the A side that might be the the kind of most traditional kind of way of telling the story. So it would be, you know, people speaking about their experiences alongside um, sounds from the land. The B-side is entirely um, sounds of the land. We felt it was really important to have, like I say, the environment also speak, also have space. Um, and it, yeah, for us to listen to it without, without us there. Um, language, thanks Sam for bringing that up. It was, um, again, really important for us that, you know, a lot of our team are ha have in indigenous endangered languages and that those should be present um, in the podcast, uh, not necessarily translated. Some of it is, some of it isn't, um, but that those can be heard and appreciated orally, but also um, that those participants who helped make it can actually listen back to it also, you know, that it doesn't just exist in English. So... Uh, it's been a, a, a challenge trying to make three versions <laughs> every time. Um, but yeah, hugely valuable, I think. Absolutely. And Samson, I want to turn to you for a second and ask, because for me, coming into this group, I'm not an artist, so learning about audio, working with you guys, has been incredible. Incredible different way of, of thinking about land and, and sound. And one of the sounds that really got to me was the sound of bees from the Malhub station, which I know we'll talk about in a bit more detail later. But I wanted to ask you, Samson, when you first came across the idea of making a podcast, so when you first, 
heard that you know the Land Body Ecologies podcast is in production. What was your immediate thought, and what was your own um, process in in producing it? I guess. Okay, thank you so much, Sam, for that uh, uh, good question. My name is Samson from the OGIEC, and uh, I work for OPDP, OGIEC People Development Program. And uh, this issue of podcast came to us, and we can say in the right time, because uh, it was just something that uh, was not in our idea, and we used to do things were tangible, things that you can touch and and you know, yeah. So uh, this issue of podcast came also to <laughs> open our mind that we can uh, record what we cannot see and what we can f uh, hear or feel. So uh, maybe for the busy, maybe somebody may be telling me to go and uh, record the sound. What about the beast things <laughs> and the rest? So anyway, <laughs> it was tough, but we, we managed uh, and uh, we have the sounds. We used we we used to go to early very early in the morning to the bushes, and uh, you could hear um, so many birds with different sounds. And um, in our community, of course, uh, we we live in the forest, and every sound in the forest is has a meaning, either for danger or uh, to show you a sign, and. Um, for bees, we had a, 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 we have a small bird that makes some sounds. And um, if you are gathering or looking for bees or honey in the forest, you could hear that sound from that bird. And you follow, you follow, you follow. So, so that bird directs you to, to where the bees are and make some funny sounds and directs you to the... So it's a, a very uh, relevant for us as uh, we normally say that we communicate with the forest, but you, you don't talk to the forest uh, through anything but through sounds, mm -hmm. different sounds. Yeah. And we've touched a, quite a lot on what the podcast is and what it was covering, uh, also a bit on why, but the title of this event is Podcast as Method for Climate and Health Research, and I just want to ask a few questions on the how so quite literally, how, if this works, yes. How do you actually go about producing a podcast? Quite technically, I mean, I, what you see on the screen now are three sites and uh, Victoria <laughs> in the last one. Um, maybe Vic, I'll, I'll turn to you to just talk about these photos, Vic and Ben, what they are and what's going on. Yes, so left to right. <laughs> it's confusing because I'm seeing it here as well. We'll start with, um, that's uh, Chiang Mai, just outside of Chiang Mai um, in the Pakenyao community. And that is um, a young boy called Chatawa, who is actually uh, Sway, who's also been part of Lambod Ecologies. You might have had coffee with him as part of the programme. Uh, it's his son. And um, this is his umbilical cord tree. So in, in Pakenyao culture, um, whenever a baby is born, um, their umbilical cord is uh, put in a small bamboo box and it's then the father goes and finds a tree and ties it to that tree and then that person is connected to that tree for, for their entire lives and beyond. Um, so this is Chatua listening to the inside of his umbilical cord tree. So we use these very specific microphones, they're like contact microphones, which just basically means you stick them on the object and it allows you to hear um, very closely what's happening inside. So whether that's water or sap or creeks or other pests moving around um, on the wood. Uh, Babita, you should talk about the next one. So these are silkworms from Banargata, which is, the, which is where we have our research hub for land body ecologies in India. Um, this is a community that lives on the outskirts in the ecological sensitive zone of the Banagata National Park, uh, which also means that there's a lot of human elephant conflict. Um, every other day, there are instances of elephants who come to raid crops. So one of the mitigation strategies that the community has made over the past few years is to shift from subsistence food farming um, to silkworms. Um, so they grow mulberry that the silkworms feed on and make cocoons. And these cocoons are then sold in the market to make silk yarn. 
Um, so these, these silkworms are ever prese present. Um, if you go to every home in the hamlet there, uh, you'll find these, and this is something that families do together, the communities do together. It's very, very analog, but till then, they were the silent bits in our whole inquiry around this. We've had lots of conversations with people about why they went to move to silkworms and uh, what they do, etc. but we'd never, we'd seen the silkworms, but this was the first time we heard them. Um, I didn't know that they had a sound. Uh, it was really interesting to have the women who rear these silkworms also listen to it. Uh, they've probably been doing it for years, but they never heard them before. Um, so it was, it was just experiencing a very, very everyday part of their life in a new way. Um, so it worked in the community as well. It wasn't just about telling that story to the outside world. And then the last one is Victoria uh, in uh, the Arctic North in a uh, hydropower dam. So a lot of the work that LB has been covering is about communities whose lands are threatened or from which they've been evicted either through different forms of fortress conservation or from, um, especially in the Arctic North, kind of um, renewable energies uh, applied in a very aggressive and discriminate manner. And this hydropower dam was built across the ancestral rivers of some of our collaborators. Uh, they used to be fishermen, fisher people, uh, for salmon. And uh, this hydropower dam now sits there. And you can hear the dam if you're outside of it, like it's massive turbines. But if you listen to it upriver, where above water, all you can hear is birds and tricklings, and you put some hydrophones, which are underwater microphones underneath, what you hear is the most metallic, cacophonous sound you've ever heard in your entire life. And within those waters, salmon would historically try and navigate and use their internal sonar. And obviously, you can immediately understand how something like this would uh, just destroy that and make it impossible for them to, to exist in that landscape. And in this case, um, in terms of techniques, Victoria is using two geophones, which are what scientists would use to measure earthquakes. But they basically just record really low frequency sounds, so all the deep rumbles of the motors and the engines. And you can see that this thing is just churning. It's just churning up the river. And you can just hear it in this absolutely chest-rattling bass um, that would be captured in this take. Yeah, I think um, I would just add that sound in this research hub has, has a very special meaning, actually, because the river was when the river was dammed, it changed a very fast-flowing, rapid river to a completely still, silent river, almost, almost overnight. Um, and a lot of Auti Auti's research, so she's an environmental sociologist that she, uh, has led and anchored this work in the Arctic, um, has been about... Un collecting stories or understanding people's experiences um, who witnessed that change in the river. Um, and one of the stories in particular is that, um, that the sound changed and a because of that, a, a man felt he could no longer walk properly. He said, I'm so unsettled and I'm so, it's so unusual for me that I, I have to learn how to walk again. Um, and I think that just, again, speaks a lot about the power of of sound and how important sound is in how we place ourselves in space. And most recently, um, there was a visit to Uganda to Sylvia's team in um, Windy Hub. And we don't have a photo of, of Windy Hub up here, but I do want to ask a quick question about whether you could share perhaps what were challenging or interesting moments that you took to record um, the sounds of Windy. Was there any moment that seemed <laughs> a bit challenging in that process? The, um, Sylvia, the, it was a quite interesting moment because I remember even when wherever Ben would reach, he would say, please wait, wait, let me first do say, but I'm not seeing anything. What are you doing to, I should say, you wait, wait. So I remember we are going to one of the Batwa communities. It was through the jungle. And then I saw some river side and was trying to tell about the story, the story about that river, how it is deep and how there is this unique bird and then I saw him unpacking all his things and 
throwing the <laughs> everything in the river. I was like, now what are you going to do in this river? What do you want to listen to? He said, wait, don't make any sound. Then it is from there that he gave me to also listen to this. I was like, oh, there is some sound, the unique sound that comes from the rivers. And for us, as well as for us, we are used to only these sounds around, all the big sounds, but even in, in deep waters, you can be able to listen to the sounds. Uh, so that's why I say it was quite interesting in form of learning and also curious about what it will come out, how it will all come out. So I was gonna say, I mean, I think, I think it's what you said about silence and what you were saying, Sylvia, as well. I think what, the, in a way, I, th I feel sometimes that sound and the sound that we experience just out in the world is one of the, s the senses we have the least control over. And I think sound is done to us much more than we are able to, uh, um, to choose how it arrives at our ears. Um, and, and I think it is the, the first sign of, of urbanism, of uh, displacement, of deforestation, whether it's through an absence of sound or through an overabundance of sound. But in all the cases, uh, the communities that we're working with are j just stood in the middle, having this sound be even, even given or removed from them. Um, so much so that, you know, with Sylvia's community, um, who, you know, anybody, if I'm correct, Sylvia, with my chronology, anybody over the age of 30 was born in the forest and will have been used to a, an acoustic atmosphere that a Batwa child born today just would not know that sound and would not know what that sound world is like. And so we talked about trying to capture it and recreate it a, a little bit as much as we could, right, when we were there. But. So... Yeah, should we, well, sorry, I've moved on to, to another slide over there. Um, that shows Mao Hub, and uh, you can see Samson, I'm looking at you, because um, I remember when I visited uh, OPDP in, in Kenya with Vic, and it was the first time I had seen Victoria in action when it comes to podcasting and recording sounds, and just, Sylvia, what you've said I've resonated a lot with, the whole moment of shh, you know, you take one step away, forward, whatever, <coughs> you're immediately instructed to shut up. <laughs> and not just shut up in the sense of zip your mouth. Shut up in the sense of stay still, do not move. You have no idea how powerful these mics are. <laughs> so I wanted to turn to this slide and ask you, Samson, to tell everyone what's happening here and what you were uh, recording. Um, as OPDP's team? So, <coughs> uh, the first one with the um, old man who is trying um, a log hive, Mze Sanare, he's um, buying, uh, tying the, the hive ready for hanging. And uh, before that, he makes some um, singing to the hive. Yeah, before now, he climbs to the um, to the tree where he installs the hive. So on this end, we have uh, my colleague Lillian with the bee suit <laughs> to protect herself from the stings, and uh, she is now taking in she is in action taking the sound from a uh, uh, log hive. So we talk a lot about pa the podcast being a method for research. Why is it that you focused on bees? and hive making for y the episode dedicated to Mao Hub. How was that decided? Yes, bees are our livestock, as we say. We don't have uh, any other form of livestock e except bees. They are, we depend bees for everything, for honey and uh, everything. So uh, I in case of any climate or um, weather change in pattern, we see effect of uh, bee migrating, we we, we, we read the behavioral change in terms of their migration, how they are nesting, different blossoms. So we are connected to bees and they listen to us. What I think was particularly, uh, as a method, valuable about the, the Yogi episode, uh, it's called Honey. 
get it wherever you get your podcasts. Um, that was uh, it. Was m- most of the 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 recording in in the in the hub and in the forest and the bees was done entirely by um, the Ogiek members of the team, and so it wasn't done by anybody from London going over there or anything. It was it was done almost entirely um, with the equipment that we sent you guys, and and so so it's kind of built like that. And I think like that's generally a really powerful function um, again of audio but of podcast as well which is the ability to share and distribute is very strong and I think it's where it can really become a very powerful method for with reach when it comes to talking about as kind of an intervention in research I was just going to add with this as well as I thought it really interesting that it wasn't a traditional interview that you might find with normal podcasts you know it was just Sonare making his hive talking you through it and then sort of bursting into song around it. So again, it's those kind of recordings or experiences you wouldn't get if you were coming over and doing a formal interview. You know, it's the relationship that Samson has with his community and um, yeah, just the process of, of seeing someone, you know, observing, listening to someone at work. We always, when we, when we first provide the recorders to the communities, and so shame Lillian is also not able to join Samson on stage because they collaborated together, but she, I did a training session with her specifically, and the two, the two rules that we give is, one is get your own, yourself as far away from your microphones as you can, because you're not trying to record yourself, you're trying to record something else, so start it recording, get as far away from it as you can to still do your work. And the second one is just always leave it running, because you don't know when an interview turns to a conversation, turns into a song, turns into something else. And so record long and record far is kind of what we try and do. Um, and it, you know, in this case, I think it captures something very specific and very magical. And that's something actually our team worked on documenting and not just in the form of audio, but in academic publications. So we collectively wrote um, an article in the Journal of Climate and Health on how transdisciplinary collaborations like this one can actually be used as a method to surface um, expressions of of suffering and any expression in sometimes more um, sensitive ways. And what you've said, Vic, right now about uh, the hive making process and the act of demonstrating how to build a hive as opposed to talking about that. Um, And we'll go into that in a second, but I'm hoping we can also have <laughs> a bit of audio recording here. But Samson, do you want to tell everyone what's on the screen now? <coughs> yes, that uh, old lady having um, a comp. And uh, probably uh, when harvesting the bees, after smoking the hive, bees now develop uh, different sounds. And uh, you could tell whether they are now uh, relaxed, ready for harvest, or they are still uh, aggressive. So this smoking makes them um, a bit docile, and uh, some these sounds uh, are interpreted, and you know that the height is ready. Now you can, yeah, you can ha- start harvesting height. Can we try playing the audio on this clip, please? to just ask for a quick reaction about anything that may have stood out in that recording from the audience. 
no pressure. We will have Q&A afterwards, but now that we know that we can play some of the audios, you'll hear more. <laughs> Not that one, not yet, because we have to cue that one. So, um, Sylvia, I want to turn to you and maybe explain, to, to explain what's on screen now to our audience. On the photo that is on the screen, there is a tree house, one of the houses where, like, in which we lived in, and mainly that tree house was specifically for protection, like when the parents are away for hunting, they would keep the children up in the tree to protect them from the wild animals. And then there would be some elder on the doorway to protect them until the parents come. Uh, we had different house, houses in the forest and that is one of them and they all had different meanings like when you're still a youth for the youth it was there like for new married couples it was there and then for the elders and for the kids so that is how even the forest those houses had different meanings and we do have um a recording to play from the process of developing the podcast episode on Windy Hub. But I want to turn to you, Ben, and Babita, because you were both with Sylvia a few months ago uh, to start producing this episode. So before we play it, can you cue us up and prepare us for what we're about to hear? I can do it. I'll do it. listen to one of the songs that Sylvia's community are immensely, immensely talented at singing and dance. Um, so we're going to listen to one of the songs and what I, I just wanted to add another thing about the role that sound and music plays. Um, so I, we work in India and I'd gone to visit Sylvia in Uganda and um, we were trying to talk about the forest in India and how maybe some of the struggles are similar uh, with what Sylvia is facing in Uganda. But there was one point when we played uh, one of the songs from Banargata. And then when I came back home, I played some of Sylvia's community songs back to the community um, in Banargata. And um, there was just... I suppose people's eyes light up differently when you move beyond language and words, um, and that's what we experienced there, so I just wanted to share that as well. Yeah, I think the, um, the Sylvia's community, uh, and Sylvia can obviously talk about this much more precisely than I can, but um, w w one of the main things that you guys do, and w one of the big ways that s some of your community members make money is by performing for tourists. And so that's kind of become like one of the trades, right? So like tourists come to pay $6,000 to visit the gorillas, but they, but they come and visit your communities and you guys perform uh, your, your cultural acts uh, for them. And some of those songs, are kind of within that. And I was wondering maybe before we play this, if you could just talk a little bit about how the songs have changed or have evolved since the community left the forest and since they began singing for tourists and you sing songs differently when you're just on your own and you're singing for each other. Yeah, thank you very much as one of the ways we could communicate or we can pass the message was through singing as it was also part of our culture like i remember even this one a time culture is in born because we had just joined the school and we are many batwa and we saw how we were being discriminated and one of the ways we could communicate our message like when we are discriminated against we would go somewhere and then we s immediately we compose a song and that song would be having a meaning. Either it is a grief song or maybe like when you feel you're happy, immediately you sing and when someone comes you feel like these people, they are happy when they are not happy. And now that it is part of our culture, one of the ways we do 
to earn a living, it is to perform our culture to the tourists, and then we pay, they, are pay, they pay us. However much this does not benefit us directly, and we feel maybe is it part of that? Are we selling our culture for, to earn a living? And among the songs we pray, we sing, it is not that we just sing, because I said all these songs, they have a meaning. However much we perform to them that we want, they, they can pay us and we get something to eat, we sing the songs accordingly. There is the first song that we sing to welcome them, a welcome song, and then there we, see, we sing for them how we were not happy leaving our forest and how the forest sustained us and how we lived the, with the gorillas and, and that is the second song. And later we'll also be appreciating the forest, we would also appreciate the forest and the nature, but mainly the songs we sing, they all have a meaning the songs of grief and the songs of happiness. And the one that we have, which, which one is that? The one that we're going to play? It's the same one as the foreign one. Do you remember? We'll play it. We'll, yeah, play, we'll, it. Play, it really. we'll play that first. So we're going to play this uh, recording. Close your eyes. <laughs> Very far it is in the park, that is where we lived. That this is this where we are, it is not our home. Then they are also saying that we had never imagined that we would leave our home and find ourselves here. So mainly they, they are telling tourists that however much they are performing them for them, but that is not where they belong. They belong in the park the forest where they had never imagined that they would live. That is what the song is all about. Thank you. Uh, ben and Babita, you were there when um, the singing took place. Do you want to share a bit about your reactions in that moment? Um, yeah, I mean, um, when people are singing, this makes me cry. So uh, I was, very, it was very like, I found it incredibly emotional. We we went, we I mean, it was really special as an experience, but obviously that's not the point. But it was, 
um, we went, um, when we first arrived, Sylvia's com community took us to the, the sort of the tourist experience, so the area where they were traditionally performed for the tourists. And this recording, though, we did later when we'd spent more time together uh, and it was with a bigger group um, and it was more informal in a way and it was in a clearing that wasn't up on the mountain, it was down down and amongst the town so that like, you could hear some the deep bass notes you could hear, I think, were motorbikes. And there's, I think, a plane that goes overhead at one point as well, which... Um, which is all part of it, right? That's the sound world that those songs now exist in, whereas before they would have existed in the acoustically sort of quiet sound of the jungle, and now they, they exist in this really different acoustic space. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was... Yeah, I don't know, really. I don't really know what to say about it. <laughs> because it, it was just really... It was, I, I find the songs of the Batois sing incredibly moving, partly because I think just the compositions and the way that they do it, that call and response and the, the tonality of the women's voices in particular um, and, and the rhythm. So they often, you guys often play with a drum as well, right? There's like a, just a drum that is like hits a beat um, for, for a lot of the songs as well and it kind of just drives forward. And I, d I just find them incredibly powerful, powerful pieces of music. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, this recording was from towards the end of our time there. Um, and like Ben said, we did, um, we listened to the music on the first day itself and then right on the last day, possibly the last evening that we were there is when we recorded this. And by then we'd gotten to know each other better. Um, and what was really, really um, important and striking to me was um, the fact that when we asked them whether there were other songs that they don't perform for the tourists, um, there were several which came out came our way, um, which was about life in the forest, which were not always joyous. Some of them were sad, um, and um, some of them were, were laments. And um, yeah, it was it was moving. And I, th I think sorry, I think I think um, there's like also an interesting. Um, kind of inherent um, critical issue, right, within within both the song's meaning, but then also the positionality of, of myself, but also Bebita as outsiders, they're recording it. And I think that, that speaks a lot to, I think, what is both uh, so fascinating and powerful with the act of recording. And it's like, who is recording? Who who is Who is holding that recorder? Whose pocket does the SD card go into? And ultimately, where does the file get sent? And who gets to distribute it? And who gets to? Um, and so I think you know when you're, um, when when I as, as a white British person am stood in a country that is downstream of you know severe colonialism and is suffering from, um, you know, conservation policies that are driven by it, and um, being sung a song that is about the downstream effects of that, um, there's all sorts of inherent complicated issues around around positionality uh, but I think the song is also performed and, and given in an act of generosity and expression and and it's ultimately a tool with which that community will craft the narrative it won't be us you know so I think that's yes what I can say that uh, songs are meaningful for the community and uh, they are mode of passing messages to each other. And uh, maybe if you can understand uh, that language, normally they sing to express what they are feeling, what they are, uh, they are undergoing. And uh, this brings a lot of um, unity and a feeling that they belong and they are together. Because uh, using different instruments, different mes key messages, brings up the community together and uh, a form of solidarity to which uh, whatever they are facing. So I feel songs are uh, a, a bit uh, of importance and meaning to the community. And everything you've said now, uh, the fact that songs carry so much meaning and, and emotion and very often even across languages, I, I didn't understand what was being sung there, but I, I do walk away with an emotion. And this m carries on to my next point a bit because I wanted to ask a little bit, Ben, you mentioned your positionality, being an outsider. Um, 
but also Land Body Ecology's team, we, we talk a lot about why we were so adamant about having these community embedded hubs to do this work in order to gain trust. So I just want to add a little bit to this conversation and ask a, a question of how do you go about a process like this and build trust with communities? Um, I have a next slide here and maybe Vic, I'll, I'll turn to you to talk about um, your process and approach to this. Thanks, Sam. So um, I think Babita has mentioned a lot since we've been here, this idea of friendship and friendship first. Um, you know, it's a, it's a privilege to be welcomed into a community at all. And it's also can be very challenging, you know, about, I think you constantly feel like you need to get out of the way, <laughs> or I do when I'm recording. Um, so I think it's worth saying that these partnerships, I mean, we can again see the Ogiet community there, I can see Emily on the screen, um, they're, they're built over time and they're built, um, yeah, like I say, as partnerships. So I'll talk about the Arctic picture first. Um, ben and myself were really fortunate to be able to record the um, annual Sami uh, reindeer corral up on a Buono mountain uh, in uh, so-called Sweden, Satmi. Um, and, you know, we, we were there with uh, a group of reindeer herders, mostly mostly men, some women, um, who, who th this is a very sacred space. You know, you, they, didn't, they didn't want outsiders in there. We were welcomed in with Jenny Lati, who's again another partner of ours, and her husband, who is himself a reindeer herder and a filmmaker. Um, so they were gradually kind of introducing us being there and um, what we were doing. And again, I think because, because sound is unusual and um, it's, you know, one guy actually turned to me and said, why are you not making a film? <laughs> and I was like, well, um, <laughs> that's just not what we're doing. But um, it is, it is, it's a really beautiful thing to be able to gift that to someone to be able to hear that sound back, and especially when these, um, you know, these experiences in themselves are are under threat and they are endangered, and those those sounds are therefore endangered. And um, you, yeah, it was it, it, it's like Ben said, inher inherently complex. But if I guess I think it's about friendship, trust, building time. Don't just go there once, you know, like work that journey out together. Um, and I think, I think Samson, it, maybe you should talk about this extraordinary experience that we had um, when we were actually welcome to go hunting and walking with the Ogiek. You know, again, Sam, you were also there. You know, it was a really uh, amazing experience. We spent the day just walking through the forest together, learning about um, the plants and, and the hyrax. Yes, um, it, this is when we were with Sam and Vicky, and uh, some elders took us to the forest uh, hand to hunt the hyrax. Hyrax, this is the hyrax, as you see. And uh, a hyrax is a very important animal for us as the Ogiek, because as you can see, it's, uh, we eat it, and we also use the skin to make the, 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 the cloth. So uh, for the hyrax, hyrax makes some sound. And uh, for the last 10 days, I have not had the hyrax here. <laughs> so when back in home, I, I when maybe in the evening, it's around from 9 to 11, around our center, you hear s different sound from hyrax. So it's an indication. And that reminds me of um, where I come from. So when I hear that sound, I know that I'm in the right place. And um, hyrax could make different sounds, and uh, this different sound could be interpreted whether um, uh, on relation to whether it will rain or it will, it will not rain. So it's a, it's a form of communication. So the, the, the indigenous people knows how to listen to the sound and tells you it will rain or it will not rain. My favourite fact about the hyrax, though, and I'm looking at Nishant in the room, is that its closest genetic relative is the elephant, which I just always find extraordinary when you when you look at it. 
That is incredible. I didn't actually know that. I don't know how to continue. <laughs> um, sorry, did you want to add anything that we don't know? So in terms, um, we spoke a little bit about trust, building trust, but in creative methodologies like creating a podcast, uh, very often you don't know what the outcome is going to be. And um, I wanted to ask a question to the whole team about whether you found the whole process, whether it's your individual episode or the entire podcast series, if you had an idea of what the outcome could, would be. No, I see the, okay, no. And if not, maybe to share a little bit about how you navigate that, I guess, um, uncertainty. Yeah, I can start with that. I think there's a real practical thing, which is we just have hours and hours and hours of sound. Um, so the, I think, again, what our podcast is, I guess, slightly different is that it's not written in advance. It's not, uh, like Ben said, narrated. It is sort of this archive of recordings that then as a team we navigate through and compose together. And that composition is also, the narrative composition is also led by each local hub. So I guess my, mine and Ben's role in this is largely technical. <laughs> um, and actually the, the narrative... Um, and the uh, shape of the episode is really led by the individual hubs. I can maybe add a little bit about uh, what it means to be emergent. Um, it requires patience, but what it also means is that you're responding to the day, the, the place, the people who are there in that moment. Um, I remember early on when we began working in Banargata, my colleague, Romit left a uh, recorder just recording for 24 hours. Um, again, we didn't know what's going to come out of it. We, we figured after coming back that it's probably just going to be the water, the motor pump, and we're not going to hear anything else. But incredibly, at like 2 a.m. or so, there were these sounds of bad electronic music in the background. And remember, this is a forest and this is right outside the forest, like pretty much the forest. And this is what we heard and it really brought alive to us this incredible tension that this place is going through in like the never ending expansion of the city of Bangalore. And while we see it, while we hear about it, we encounter it ourselves that moment of just listening to bad electronic music amongst the quietness of the forest uh, brought it alive in ways that we couldn't have predicted. It was just there because it happened to be there. It happened to be there that night. And um, that's what we learned. Uh, to me, at first, when this was explored, when it was, it started, I didn't know how it was going to end because I knew it was going to be like any other researchers that come and go. So, however much at first I was like, okay, let us start. We are agreed to work with you. But I didn't know where it was going to end and how it was going to end. And it is from there when these people moved all the way from London to the local communities to launch the project. And they associated with the people, with the community members. They sang for them. They were all, it was like a family and people were very happy about this. And now it continued and all the methods that I explored in this research, they are really unique and they created a strong intimacy between the people we are working with because I wouldn't know that. We have now become like a family. We are a family. Because at first I thought we are going to be like strangers. They come, then go. But now we feel we are a family. They are part of us. We are part of them. We don't look at them as maybe strangers. That's why when I meet Babisa, I say my sister because he's from there. When I meet Vicky, Ben, Sam, and that is the whole thing that has brought this uniqueness in the research, which I didn't think about that this is how it's going to end. 
I mean, I think Vic often says, be a human first when you step into those spaces and, you know, let the rest of the things you're there to do follow afterwards. And I think that's kind of something that I think as artists, perhaps it's easier for us to do uh, because we, we have the privilege of being able to enter spaces with a kind of almost Zen-like child mind of, you know, trust, trust the process and trust the people you're working with. And I think the, the situations and the communities you're working with are living through such complex series of problems and they themselves are such resilient, strong spaces that you can't but step into that space and find emergence and find, find the stories there to tell that need to be told. Um, and like Vic said, you know, our role is largely technical. I think it's about, like field recording, you set your mic and you get out of the way. And I think yeah. for me, it's, it's a very similar process, you know. This is an interesting one, though, Samson. This, I ended up driving a car to get us here <laughs> in Kenya. <laughs> it wasn't my car, <laughs> talking about emergence. Um, yeah, maybe we can talk about Samuel and where he wanted to do his interview and how we ended up there. Yes, <clears throat> I remember this one. Uh, as you see, the elder is very, it's not happy. He's very serious, and uh, this is this place uh, they were evicted from. And uh, we were actually going to see, and uh, uh, he recalled how things were when he was living there. That's why you see him, the stern face, yeah. So on the other end, we have two elders, Samuel and um, Sam, so yeah, and doing some, yes, covering the honey bag. Yes, and this is still the same day when we were in the forest. Yeah, do you want to add some? Because you were you were also yeah. part of this experience. Um, yes, I, I do remember that moment because we had a, you know, we had a plan, an agenda, of where to go, and you know, Victoria and I just kept being guided by the community. So in that moment, it started with asking some, um, asking Samuel a question of, "What do you want to tell us?" And he said, "I want to show you," and that's how we ended up there. It's not questioning. Is that on our route? Is that fitting in our timeline? How long are we staying? Will we make it on the road in time? You just, my personal reflection is you're always guided by the community and you trust just as much as you want to be trusted. You, you trust and, and you follow sometimes. Uh, but I do want to leave some time for the audience to ask questions. But before I hand over to you, um, there is another, there are two more episodes of the podcast coming, one from Wendy and one from India. And I wanted to turn to Babita on the next slide to cue us up for the final recording you'll listen to today before we open up for a Q&A. Sure. Um, so this is Kenchama. She's one of the first, she's, she's 90 plus, and she's one of the first people we started working with. The first time we met her, right at the beginning of the project, um, we were talking to her about her life and how she came to be there, how the land has changed. She was, she was unwell. She, was, she didn't know us too well at that point, and she was, quite, she was not very forthcoming. And then our partner, Vishala, asked her if she could sing the song um, of ragi, which is their primary staple crop, um, which they all grow. Um, and uh, she sang the song for us. Um, and... Her, her lament was the fact that the songs have gone along with traditional forms of ragi cultivation, which anchored them to that land, which is, which is important cultural, spiritual practice for them. And so all of these were losses that were embodied in that song that she sang for us. Uh, but over the course of the project, what's interesting is that many of the women we've been working with have sung the song to us at several points versus three years back when they rarely sang that song to each other. So much so that we joke that the song's stuck in all our heads now, and I'm sure it will be in all your heads after you hear it. Um, yeah, but I think, um, I think what this stands for, and for us, what these songs have meant, and the sort of grief and um, suffering that Exp that are expressed through these songs and through what they've shown us, through what we've been able to record, I think um, 
also stands for loss of cultural practice, for spiritual practice, livelihoods. But more than all of that, I think it stands for extremely profound and deep love. Um, that is the basis for their relationship to land. Um, and for us, I think audio and stories in the podcast has been a means of listening to that love um, and hoping to share that with all of us so that we can listen to that love in our own heads and in our own hearts. Thank you, Babita. Can we cue up this audio? It was a great. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I didn't think, yeah. And now we turn to the audience. <laughs> Do you have any questions for our panelists? Um, if you do, please put your hands straight up, raise them, raise them, and wait for a mic to reach you. We have one in the front here. One. We'll maybe ask two at a time, if that's okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so when you go to record the nature, how far do you go to not interview with the audio? That is one way I have another one I'd give you. <laughs> and do you find similarities when you record nature sounds? Like, um, I mean, does nature sound similar in different places? So that's, does nature sound similar in some places? And how far do you go in recording nature? Can we ask? Oh, oh an another question? Yeah, I think so. Um, thanks for the panel. I think I had a more uh, self-reflection -re based question is when you create this type of art, um, knowing that we might be the reason for a lot of these indigenous cultures being lost, um, how does it affect you? Like, how does it affect your life? And like, what do you feel uh, when you go to these places and, and hear these stories? Well, I'm going to take the first one. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I mean, uh, there's a lot of different styles of recording, right? And, and I think a lot of people, um, does anyone in here do field recording? I should have asked that at the top. Yes, great. You do, fantastic. So I, I don't know how you guys do it. Uh, but like I, like I said before, like we like to record for very long times and very far away. The reason we get far away is because um, we're trying to remove ourselves from the space as much as possible. So we work a lot with remote field recorders we, uh, that we can leave in locations for very long periods of time. So, what's up? Oh, is it? Sorry. Um, <laughs> that we can leave up for very long periods of time. So we've left recorders up for, for months at a time, um, for, uh, sometimes. Um, and so it, it depends on the thing we're recording. Um, you also sometimes have to consider damage you might cause in trying to go to a place and like, do you need to record it? Do you need to be the person to record it is also the other thing, right? And so I think it's, again, that notion of, um, it doesn't have to be you with your mics like striding out into the wilderness. I think it's, if, if it's part of a wider process and it's part of a wider 
body of work that you're doing as an artist or as a group of people. Um, the, the, the methods that you can use to, to record things are, are almost immeasurable. You know, you could, you could take this into a forest and get something, right? Like the best recorder you've got is the one that's on you at that moment in time. It's the cliche for field recordists. But um, so yes, we go to a lot of effort, both technical, but also like philosophical about the disturbing nature or interfering with it when, when we do record. Yeah, I was just going to talk about, um, we developed a recorder called the Open Field Recorder. Uh, you can check it out online. Um, and uh, like Ben said, for us as a studio, we also create um, stuff with technology. So we actually wanted to create a recorder that we could leave out in the rainforest for um, uh, months at a time that didn't require a battery change, that didn't require someone being in the forest and disturbing the habitat. Um, and we did that in Indonesia. Um, we put a camera trap next to the recorder so we could see uh, what species had also passed by, and there were tigers, there were elephants. So, you know, so we're always trying to, yeah, think about technology critically as as well. And um, like Ben said, think about do you, do you need to go? Is there another way to do it? Sometimes, you know, so someone will say, "I want you to come. <laughs> I want you to do it," and then that's probably the the, the right approach. But other than that, yeah to find different systems. I can um, attempt to think about your question. I think, um, I mean, most of the hubs that, all the hubs that we're working with are with, are, there are marginalized communities and these are people who are on the margins due to a bunch of reasons. And for us, I think our research itself, um, it was important not to reflect not to have the same framework that marginalizes them be reflected in our research framework as well. It was important, like I said before, for it to be emergent. And I think we challenge each other. I think what we've managed to do is build a relationship over five years of six years of being in that place now. Um, we challenge each other. We've had farmers who grow food naturally come up to us and make us the, the placeholder for city people who don't understand why food that might not look good um, um, requires a lot more effort. And we challenge each other. We have honest conversations. I don't believe in shying away. Um, I don't believe that I am an objective researcher. I am very much um, part of that relationship. I bring myself to it and I hopefully allow others to bring themselves to it as well. Yeah, to also answer your question on how we feel about recording those recordings about the cultures, uh, it's quite challenging and we feel nervous and we know it is not a good story, or be good to hear all those what people are feel, feel about, but it is, one way of passing a message, sending a message to people, and also knowing how people are feeling about their culture loss. And because remember, when we, we also meet some challenges, like someone feels unhappy and he's emotional and he doesn't want to give you a message because there is one of the elders in one community where we went, when we, we are consenting, and told him we wanted to know his life in the story, in the in the his life in the forest. And he said, "What I, if I tell you my story or my life in the forest? What are you gonna give me? If I tell you what I lost in the forest, you know I lost the forest and I also lost everything that was in the forest. If I share with you all this, are you going to give it to me back? Or will I get it back?" And he just sat in the and kept quiet, he just, so all that were like, it is a sad story to share, a sad moment, but it can as well be a way of sending a message. Yes, I can say that um, through this uh, research, there are gaps in our stories that uh, we used to have this, and what happened? For instance, in our place, we used to have um, 
sounds maybe for Columbus monkeys, but uh, for now we don't have them. What happened? So you you have in that in theory, but uh, in the actual context, what happened? So so this research helps us to identify what happened, uh, what triggers this to go, and what happened. It's the big question, and now you get through this. And I think nature is so diverse. So it depends how deep you're listening. So I think like at a surface level, possibly, but then I don't think a forest. What do you think? Does, does, do, do you think forests sound the same in different places? The forest, that's why I was like, every place has its own sound. The forest had its own sound because we managed to reach in the forest and also capture that sound. And when you compare it with the com in the community where we live, it is totally different. And it is that sound that we miss, which is totally different from what was the in the forest. So the sound of the forest, it is different from the sound in the community. Yeah, it's different because uh, different birds live. Um, there are some birds which live deep, like the parrots. You don't find parrots so much on the outside and part of the forest, but you find them deep, deep, deep. And we have this one, small, small, small little birds and the rest on this side. So you find it here, different, different, different sounds. Yeah, you hear, you listen to the sounds of birds, the rivers, and that breeze, the wind, but in now in the community, it's just noisy, the vehicles, the cars, the music, the phone, and that makes it crazy that at least there is calmness in the forest. <laughs> T tell us about the sound of London. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you just put your mic down, like, no. <laughs> Any other questions in the audience? We have one in the middle, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the talk. That was really interesting. Um, you've been, you've really, I mean, the recordings provide a window for us to experience these different communities whilst we're quite far away. Um, I'm also wondering, and I think uh, Ben uh, and Sylvia quickly mentioned this, um, about these recordings uh, being used by the communities themselves. I think there was some talk about reconstruction, reconstructing the uh, sounds of the forest for the children in Sylvia's communities. Um, I'm just curious if you could elaborate on that. It was Do you want me to? <laughs> I mean, um, it's a really good question because I think it touches upon how the podcast is a form of documentation of your culture. So if I'm not mistaken, um, if you could share a little bit about how uh, the podcast is doing that for your culture and why it's meaningful for your community. For instance, to document language or anything else for generations. Um, the podcast creates a very meaningful with a community member because here they, they take part doing this research because they are the ones who are recording these sounds. When you saw on the photos of the Ogek, they are the ones making the beehive. And even when we use the Polaroid cameras, they are the people who are doing or taking photos of their choices of what they feel. And that is how I say that is how the community gets involved in research through podcast. And yeah, it was, Sylvia and I, when we were there, we had a conversation which was about this idea of the sounds that, well, specifically with one community member who used to be, uh, he's called Jeffrey, and he used to be, uh, he was one of the few Batois who were employed as park rangers, 
which you would think would be like the lowest hanging of fruit, right? Like you could employ it, at least to give the people who you kicked out of the forest a job to guard the forest, but no. Um, and so, but Jeffrey was, Jeffrey GPS was his nickname. And uh, we were trying to get him to describe the sound of the forest. So we were like, well, what did it sound like? What did it sound like? And, um, and we found it very hard to, to find a language where we could meet on that. And so we were trying to talk in about trying to record it as much as possible from the edges to try and like give it to him to listen maybe or just even just to have it and be able to like be like is this what it could sound like but it's imaginary right it's an imagined audio space that they can't really go back to i can add quickly actually yeah. i was just with the reindeers um there's quite a good example of that so there's a a Sami museum called Laponia in um, Satmi. And um, we're just talking at the moment about those recordings um, being there permanently, again, go going to where they should be, really. It's great to show them in London, but um, yeah, <coughs> having that recording there permanently. We have three minutes left, so one more question right here in the front. Third, fourth row? Third row. <laughs> Yeah, actually just building off of your question, wondering what the other like avenues or actions or benefits felt by your two communities have been in India and in Kenya. And um, I'd love to just hear more. What action, sorry? The, what, what benefits um, Samson and Babatha's communities have felt from the podcast not only just the making of it, but in receiving the completed thing. <coughs> yes, thank you for your question. And um, I may respond this, that uh, this podcast or um, recording help us uh, revive and know which, um, what happened and uh, which sounds were there. And uh, there are some of our community who are driven away from where they lived. And uh, through this, they don't even now access to what they used to hear or uh, listen from the forest. So it's a form of a, a repository for keeping our, our sounds so that we can uh, listen even with outside of our land. Yeah, um. And also what we feel that we have benefited in this, it is that we are part of it and we, ha we have been working closely in the, in, in the research. We feel indeed this is part of our research because like it is even the first research that we are having our own paper being published in the name of the community, which is not easy and which we can't take for granted. And now we feel really this is how we have benefited. And more to that, the community also benefited directly in the way that we used the community members as research assistants. And as you have been seeing, most of the people that are involved in this research, they are community members themselves around the whole, all, all hubs. And it, it also had some bit of the intervention purpose. That is what I always ask about myself. When you come to do research, how do people benefit? Is it all, all about your academic purposes? You come, do research, and then you go. And now the community don't, in one way or the other, benefit. And this way, this is how it has also helped like the wind hub to be supported in basket weaving, which is part of their culture, and also as a way of improving their livelihoods because they are making some money or they are earning, they are earning money through making these baskets which we have brought in this shop, in the Welcome Collection Shop. Uh, yeah, that is the way I see we have benefited. <coughs> um, two things.
things. One, we haven't finished the India podcast, so they haven't heard it. But I think uh, one significant thing across all of our hubs is the intergenerational rift between the old and the young. Um, through this, through both the process and the outputs, I think there have been more spaces for the young and the old to relate and connect. Um, the second, I think, is what we want to and what we have done and will do is to also share stories across the hubs because we also want to hear other people's stories, right? So I think they're also really powerful means to share and find solidarity and find connections across the globe um, in places that are extremely hard to live in. Thank you all. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today's panel. Um, so thank you all for joining. Um, instead of ending this session abruptly, I kind of want to be as creative as Ben, although this was his idea. Just to end with a few moments of silence as to phase out of the session we were in, just in the spirit of the sounds we were listening to and today's session. So if you could just sit as Vic would say, as still as possible. <laughs> Don't move and listen. Okay, thank you everybody. Please join me in a round of applause for my colleagues. And please listen to the podcast, I have to say. <laughs>